Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And once again, we have Dr. Andre with us. And uh, before I uh, continue with this, for those of you who are here for the first time, I'd urge you to go back and catch up with the first part of our conversation where we got to understand his journey. And uh, that would be very important for you to know where he comes from when he shares uh, his perspective on energy transition and nuclear and all that. At least if you have understood his background, you'll be able to better relate to what we're going to talk right now. So with that, we'll jump into the conversation. Andre, welcome back to Future Fast and thank you so much for making time to be here with us. You're welcome. It's a pleasure and thank you for having me. Oh, uh, so let's let's jump in to say what is energy transition? You did mention uh, though in our first part of the conversation, you took us through briefly from 200 years yeah, ago. But yeah. I thought let's bring the context here to this conversation to take it forward. Yeah. For me, energy transition means uh, getting rid of our addiction to fossil energy. <clears throat> Because uh, besides uh, the, the, the climate and the CO2 emissions uh, issue, there are um, uh, disadvantages of fossil energy too, which have to do with health, right? So there are other emissions, you know, uh, particulates and all, and, and, and all that. Um, we, we, we all know the London fog. Um, you, 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 well, you know the emissions uh, in India, you know, coal-fired power plants. A fossil has serious uh, uh, health impacts, uh, has serious uh, footprint uh, impacts, and has serious accidents uh, uh, impacts with, well, I would say millions of deaths, right? And uh, this already existed since we have fossil. Um, fossil has also a good, very good side uh, because uh, it has a high energy density. Eh? We, as uh, human beings, we lived for 100,000 years at least on biomass, on wood. Uh, and when the industrial uh, uh, revolution started, we shifted to coal, to oil, to gas, and finally to, to nuclear uh, uh, energy. Uh, and uh, so for me, energy transition, in a sense, means uh, a journey from low energy density biomass to High energy, den high energy density uh, nuclear, right? So creating much more output with ever more, ever less uh, input and ever less footprint. That is in a sense uh, what the energy transition actually means. And, uh, and this is already going on in my perspective since 200 years, since we started basically shifting towards fossil and fossil uh, uh, apart from the negative impact, of course, had enormous advantages because it has driven a global prosperity. Uh, uh, let's take the period starting from 1960, where our energy input increased by a factor of four approximately. But at the same time, 1960 until today, our global wealth uh, measured in GDP increased by a factor of 100. So we learned by applying uh, fossil energy uh, in, a, in, an, in an ever more effective, in an ever cleaner way as well, to basically create wealth and prosperity uh, uh, for all. Now, of course, th that is the essence of energy transition, going from low energy density to high energy density, creating ever more output with ever less input. Now, Re more recently, the energy transition got has has gotten a more specific connotation as basically to get rid of fossil because uh, not only of its negative health uh, and safety issues, but because of the climate. And then certainly in the West, uh, so-called renewables was pushed uh, as a solution, right? And definitely since Chernobyl, the expansion of nuclear, uh, which started also, which started in the 1970s. I don't forget that um, we built our current fleet of nuclear power plants largely in 20 years time between 1970 and, and 1990, basically. Um, this journey, uh, the, this expansion of nuclear was basically stopped by, stopped by anti-nuclear sentiments 
after Chernobyl. You know, lots of fear mongering and other. We will talk about that. Yeah. And this has basically, I see, this is my point. To me, nuclear is the jewel in the crown, is is in my thinking about energy transition, is the jewel in the crown is actually the, the, the end point of the energy transition. Because theoretically, we could power the whole world uh, with about 4,000 to 5,000 nuclear power plants to provide electricity, heat, and hydrogen. That is possible. Mm -hmm. And this, for me, is the essence of the energy transition. And that would, for me personally, be the high point of the energy transition. Nevertheless, politicians in the West uh, build, it, build a case, build a business case, build a narrative about renewables, which, in my view, is the way back. Because renewables, wind turbines, solar panels, geothermal, and biomass is all again low energy density. It are all small point sources with small availability. So you need you, with, with renewables, you basically have the inversion. So just it, for the consumption or convenience of the audience and listeners, when you say yeah. density, it's about getting more out of less. Yes. Versus getting less out of more from a renewable exactly. point of view. Exactly. That is that is that is well summarized. Thank you for that. Yeah. My my definition of energy transition is getting more out of less, culminating in nuclear and renewables is exactly the inversion, getting less out of more. So right. uh, if you, you 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 if you compare nuclear to it doesn't really matter whether you compare it to uh, to solar, to geothermal, uh, or to wind, uh, even biomass. So the, the 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 natural materials input, uh, the space consumption, the critical materials input, and even the generation of waste. Right. So the is is about ten, if not two hundred times higher than of okay. nuclear. Right. Good. And this is all documented. This is all reported. This is fact. This is all well known. You know, you can you, you can look at it. And also it's understandable because the nuclear fission process, right, is basically uh, getting uh, getting energy out of nuclear cores. Right. Whilst all other processes basically uh, generate energy out of electrons if you will you know i'm talking now as a physicist it's basically do you want it from electrons or do you want it from nuclei and the energy density is is enormous right so did, did i uh, did i answer your question what is the energy transition i talked a yeah, lot but, yeah, but yeah, you yeah, summarized yeah. it much better <laughs> <laughs> no you, you did so how, how i i want to uh, ask you from your uh, perspective on how do you see the relevance of your journey through, you know, starting off in chemicals, uh, that is a shell to renewables and nuclear technology. How do you see the relevance of this journey from where you are today? Well, I think we, I think in the last, um, in the last pod podcast, we talked about purpose, right? And, yes. and the, the, the relevance, the pur my, it is my purpose to basically explain this, tell this, and advocate this. So the relevance is that, that, that the energy transition is all about create maximum clean output, so with as less as possible emissions, with minimal natural materials input and minimal footprint. That is, that is basically what my journey, my personal journey or my professional journey in fossil, renewables and nuclear, having seen it all, having studied it all, having been there at all, both on the industry side, but also on the policy advisory side, you know, it basically has taught me that this is it. It is about certain, if we want to, if we want to power uh, a civilized, prosperous, highly industrialized, industrialized planet, right? And we are becoming that step by step. We need 
high energy density and not low energy density. And my purpose is to spread this message, spread this teaching wherever I can. Perfect. So, uh, this is, uh, we, we already uh, talked about uh, what you do, but uh, one thing I uh, uh, want to understand is that throughout your career, you had very difficult decisions you had to make. So, how do you approach decision making? Because uh, one thing I think what you've learned through your journey is how you that shapes your coaching as well. Yeah. Um, well, my my of course. Being a nuclear advocate um, is is not easy uh, because uh, I have to I have to fight, if you will, uh, the fear mongering. Uh, and 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 uh, renewables definitely, let's say in my country, the Netherlands, uh, but also in the in the EU in a broader sense. Um, of course, if you if you work in renewables. Uh, and if you if if you have solar panels on your roof and all, all that, the the dominant culture in in our countries here in in the EU is 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 let's say is a green culture. So being green and uh, having your mortgage in a in a green job and and all that gives you really a social benefit. Huh? Uh, most academia, most universities. Uh, here in 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 uh, in my country uh, are inhabited by basically green uh, professors, right? So as a coach, basically I gave myself the permission, if you will, to be different. And be different is being okay. I will listen. I will listen to critics, you know, and if. If others say that I am a fool and, and all that, what I what I learned is is that it's that these kinds of reactions because I get a lot of critics right also on LinkedIn on my posts. What I've learned as a coach is the following mindset, if you will. I say it's not about me. I don't take it personal. It's basically a reaction. It's their reaction. It's other people's reaction on something that I say. But it is their script. It is it is their problem, uh, if you will. And uh, I will engage factually and, and content-based uh, uh, one or two times. Uh, and and uh, if, it, if it is then still not appreciated, because I understand that much of the anti-nuclear emotions are exactly what they are, emotions. I cannot change emotions. I cannot change other people. So, uh, Nanjunda, I, I, I deal with it. I, take, I, I took the decision to say, okay, Andre, shit will happen. Shit will come to you. But it's not yours, you know, and it's not personal. I, and I think that is an important decision, I, uh, uh, a state of mind I, I, I had to make. And also, I, I think a couple of years ago in discussions, I think I tended to become angry quite easily. And I'm still not completely there, but I always try to be friendly and, 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 and to accept, well, what, what in the first instance comes across to me as shit, basically, you know. But if I allow myself to have my knowing and have my opinion and have my teachings and don't take things personally, that was an important decision to be able to, to, to thrive in this, in this dialogue and uh, in, in this public debate about the energy transition. Well, uh... How, how do you handle when your uh, choices go wrong? 
how do you handle your decisions go wrong um i i recognize it uh and uh, i will just when it comes to that point uh i will say that i was wrong you know i made a mistake making as mistakes is that? human sorry as simple as that yeah i am a human too you know i i can't know everything um i uh i am um, my that that's basically it i uh, the, 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 i am um i can make mistakes humans make mistakes uh well, so do i uh, does it not depend on with whom you are dealing at that point in time because sure. uh, you know sometimes telling that yes i made a mistake may not go well depending on where you are with whom you are sure sure yeah that that, that is uh, you're right about it that you know um in general i will not share the, the, if i uh, talking to person a or person b right i will always make a choice as what to share <laughs> with a or b depending on who a or b is you know i'm talking now scientifically but I, i'm sure you understand it right 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 um but taking you as a very friendly empathetic person uh i i wouldn't have any uh, problems with you know admitting my mistakes in a human way uh you know with you and 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 i would actually then invite you to help me understand my mistakes you know then i think the the precondition um to uh uh to allow myself making mistakes um uh, and sharing that is of course that we treat each other uh on an equal basis you know we yeah. are uh, on a basis of you are okay i am okay right but when the relationship is not uh on the same level right if the other person would be much more dominant or would be you know yeah that, that of course then it would be uh, much more difficult and i wouldn't probably i would not admit having made a mistake you know <laughs> right but uh, andre just see now uh, when you are in uh, when you were in shell uh, you you were in science you were in r and d and research space before yeah. you moved into business development so there it's all about what you observe and data and statistics right so the argument is very clear yeah. this is what it is and that is how it is yeah but when you move into the business development it is all about not what this is but what it means to you yeah right you yeah. you try to see the value of it than it itself yeah but when you move further with that i'm i'm just referring to your own journey that now that you moved into management consulting and coaching yeah. so there it's it's a mix and highly contextual it is not necessarily what this is or what it means but yeah. when it is yeah so so how do you how did you manage to build this on to your own self to uh, evolve because uh, you know uh, we see a lot of people grow in an organization to leadership but they don't evolve to these positions right they have grown right. into this position right so so you you jumped you you jumped from one place and you also were in the policy space and uh, i don't understand policy space at all because i have not been there but uh, one thing from my observation as an outsider is always that okay you probably depend on what data suggests and what value it means and what the policy should be doing to enhance the value backed up by the data yeah i mean correct me if i'm wrong yeah so so you went through each of it and then you come into this space so where do you feel the, i mean obviously you chose at every stage right it was your choice that you wanted to yeah. move this so you just dropped this hat picked up the hat and went about at every point of time
Yeah. So today, today when you're here, if you look back, uh, how do you regard each of your journey points? Uh, where do you feel that you had the most comfort? Wow, um, I would say right now. Because um, you have a view to all of it from the past? Yeah, because, you know, my, I think my purpose was to, um, to integrate, if you will, my, 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 my scientific side with my emotional side. And uh, that, was, that is not an easy journey. Um, because uh, I, I had to learn a lot. Um, so right now, uh, I'm almost 65 now, right? I am much more comfortable with ambiguity and, and volatility and, uh, and uncertainty. Uh, and the fact that, that in basically real life is... Um, I would say decisions in real life anywhere are, let's say it, um, uh, 70% emotion and 30% facts, right? right? And I'm now at a point where I appreciate that and where I understand that and where I can live with that. Well, Andre, at the same time, you know, through the journey, it's so often, I think you also mentioned that you've been there, done that, right? Yeah. So this aspect of being there, done that, tends to make one very rigid, right? Because I know it. So yeah. how do you how do you keep yourself elastic at the same time? Because see, one side you've been there, you've done that, so you know it. But at the same yeah. time, things are very lucid. Things are changing. So how do you also keep yourself open to something new that you could be wrong and there's you need to be knowing i mean how do you how do you keep both the heads of the dragon in the same box ah right uh, right um, i have several i think the, the way i do it is that i have several boxes okay yeah i have several drawers that i can yeah that i can draw upon you know so in my in my consulting work which has nothing to do with the nuclear uh, I am I am usually acting quite fast uh, based on intuition. I do some analysis, but I talk to people and I interact with people uh, and I make suggestions. And that is that is very much, I think that is at least half intuition and emotion and feeling and uh, resonance in myself and trusting that that is okay based on the fact that I will see the things anyway, you know. And th th these are also jobs where basically I, when I start in, 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 in consulting, let's say call it management consulting, I always start with the not knowing at attitude. Do you follow me? This is, this yep. is the basic approach of being a coach, right? I, I, I trust on my own resonance basically and i don't know but i ask questions and i listen and i ask other questions and i dig a bit and i, be, I dig a bit deeper and in the meantime in the background i make this analysis because i i trust i know myself that i will make this analysis relatively quickly so these are the kind of jobs where i start from a quite neutral not knowing perspective um, where I am pretty successful, I must say. Oh, this is ideal, right? This is the ideal thing where you approach everything from a blank state. Yeah. But uh, but oftentimes it happens, right? Because, oh, I know it's the same thing. I've been there. I spent 15 years in Shell. I did this yeah, for yeah, 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 eight yeah. years. So yeah. in such a thing, how do you... Press the refresh button and say, okay, it is blank state. Let me hear it from the scratch. I, I don't want to come with any judgment. How do you push yourself back to, or hold back your judgment to, uh, for your client to 
tell you the whole thing without you stopping her in the middle and say okay i got yeah, it yeah, i know yeah, what you're yeah, trying yeah, to yeah, say yeah 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 well that that is um i try not to judge um and i try to let others do the work and let others do the thinking i think my mindset is creating awareness in a amongst others around me rather than filling things in myself or doing things myself <coughs> and i can i can do that successfully i would say uh, three quarter of the time nevertheless there are of course things that i just d- do know you know and this is of course the dilemma in the energy transition debate that i just do know that nuclear is the best we have and and i do appreciate that that a lot of people do not understand it or do not appreciate that or have these old script but there are certain uh, i would say you call them um, in dutch we call it stock paardjes you know they, of course i have it is nuclear and there are probably a, a number of other subjects as well where i basically just know because because so, there are things in life, uh, uh, you, you know, energy density, there are probably other things as well, you know, that are just true. There are things you can prove, you can talk about, it's factual, it is, it, it is just, you know, the case. And, 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 and there are, and then, of course, um, that is a, 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 a dilemma uh, that sometimes I still have, and you are right. You are right about that, and that pops up. And how do I manage it? Well, I can't. I can't because <laughs> when there is a truth, it is a truth, and 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 when it is factual, which you can check, which everybody can know, yeah, that thing. And and and, and then basically, I am also quite comfortable by um, then going into what what is called respectful confrontation. So the the thing I have to uh, I have to be aware of is don't get angry, stay kind, but stay firm, you know, and and then there is pain and there is a confrontation and then we don't agree, but then I'll say, okay, we don't agree, you know, I stick to my point, you stick to your point and we don't agree. That That is how it is. But there are, of course, some things that are non-negotiable. That that is that is um, a painful, but it is something that we have to uh, address and confront from time to time. That that's how life is. Yes, that's very true. So, uh, uh, Andre, how do you present a case for nuclear energy as the most reliable? I well, first I I, I try when I when I present it, I um, I talk about this case of of uh, energy density. Uh, and I uh, and light that with um, waste. Um, if your energy consumption and my energy consumption uh, would be expressed in terms of volumes of nuclear waste, it's mm. basically a tiny little can, right? Right. Uh, and uh, and and all the waste that uh, nuclear worldwide has produced since the 1960s fits in a cube of 30 by 30 by 30 meter uh, and that is uh, that, that is how i pitch it and then basically i give uh, that's one thing and the other thing is i show actually that even today in the year 2023 uh, expressed in what is called primary energy nuclear energy is still the biggest clean energy uh, source that we have uh, it's about five percent worldwide followed by solar and wind together, which is something like three or 4%. Then we have hydro, which is 2%. And that, that is it. So we, ha- and, and then there is biomass, but I never frame biomass as sustainable. Biomass is a sort of fossil, you know, it's, it has the same negative uh, impacts as, uh, as, uh, as fossil. So I talk well, about... How do you respond to uh, the... Uh, Chernobyl of the world. I, I mean, people come up with Chernobyl or what happened Always. in Japan. Yeah, 
Yeah. So how yeah, do you yeah. respond to that? Uh, Chernobyl was a flawed design. Um, uh, technically, the strengths and also the safety <clears throat> uh, of nuclear energy um, is basic engineering. And we call this homeostasis. So your body and my body is at a constant temperature due to what is called in biology negative feedback loops. And a nuclear power plant is safe uh, by design uh, due to these negative uh, feedback loops. So I, I explained it in a little bit more longer than I do right now. <clears throat> um, but this engineering basically ensures um, that the fission process never becomes an uncontrolled chain react reaction. Except there's one exception, which was Chernobyl. Uh, and that was known. It was a flawed design where in a certain low power range, uh, it was known that uh, probably the chain reaction was possible. And that is actually what happened. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, so that was that's a particular drama. Uh, and that is attribu attributed to, again, a combination of flawed design, bad safety culture. And what about Fukushima? Japan. Fukushima was a <clears throat> Fukushima was a hydrogen explosion, where basically uh, the cooling failed. So the most important thing is when you close a nuclear power plant. Uh, so after the earthquake, all power plants shut down automatically by basically lo lowering all the control rods, uh, due to which basically the fission process stopped immediately. That is a normal safety procedure. Um, however. <coughs> Uh, due to this tsunami, which wasn't expected with that height, um, the, uh, uh, the, the power was also cut off from the nuclear power plant. So the emergencies generated started up, also worked. But uh, in Fukushima, the emergency generators were placed uh, in, the, in the cellar of the reactor building. So they were when the tsunami came, they were flooded. Yeah, so the cooling basically stops. And uh, when the cooling stops, uh, the core starts to melt slowly. Hydrogen is produced, and the, the, there was a hydrogen uh, explosion at the attic of the boiling water reactors. Right. Uh, and so that was a that, that was um, yeah that was a cooling uh, actually a quite simple cooling failure, <clears throat> which actually also was known. Yeah, but uh, when I uh, recall correctly, at least one of these reactors almost ended the end of life, I think just two months after the uh, tsunami, at least one of the reactors was, was expected to be shut down anyway. So the regulators actually allowed uh, the emergency generators uh, to stay, to remain in the cellar of that reactor building, rather than just placing it simply 10 meters higher on the mountain. Mm -hmm. So it was a stupid, preventable, regulatory uh, stupidity. Um, the amount of radioactivity that was uh, emitted due to this hydrogen explosion was actually very relatively low because there was not a chain reaction. So there was not an, in the reactor core, there was never an explosion, right? So although the, the, the fuel melted, it stayed within the inner uh, reactor core. So the amount of radioactivity that was released uh, was very, very low. And it is now, 10 years later, uh, it is not, uh, it is basically at uh, uh, a natural occurring radiation level. So it is, it is at a normal level. And in hindsight, uh, the relatively massive evacuation that took place was totally unnecessary. And this has been uh, confirmed by the IAEA uh, and also the UNSCAR, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the External Effects of Radiation, that um, the evacuation uh, caused more harm than it, pre than it prevented. Because many elderly were evacuated, 
uh, and uh, lots of them uh, lost, unfortunately, their lives because of the evacuation stress. Oh. Uh, and but not because of radiation. And actually, oh. the IAEA never advised evacuation. But also there, you see that these decisions are made by politicians who are scared for the public, for the general public, and they they they, they take yeah unwise decisions, unfortunately. Uh. How uh, how would you uh, 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 how do you observe this current situation of the release of that uh, uh, treated water, but it is still uh, uh, contains oh. radiation, so, <laughs> and China is... is refusing to buy any more fish from Japan. Ah, Japanese Prime Minister went and ate a fish to, just to give confidence. So. Nanjun, Nanjun, that, that's all politics. That's all fear-mongering. It, it all has to do with geopolitics and commercial interests. It has nothing to do with radiation. Uh, the fact is that, uh, that uh, water is released at drinking water quality. Hmm. And uh, you can actually follow... Oh, but they say that it still contains... Uh, you can't... I mean, the best possible treatment do, is done. But it still has radiation in it. I mean, that was yeah. It has tritium. Yeah, yeah. It, it has tritium in it. Uh, as all uh, wastewater from nuclear power plants have tritium in it, so it is common practice since decades uh, that uh, nuclear wastewater that contains tritium and only tritium um, is is released. Uh, into the sea at several uh, nuclear sites uh, at much higher tritium levels than at Fukushima. Fukushima. Oh. Um, but the, the technology, uh, the release uh, has been engineered in such a way that uh, the, the, the tritium level is at drinking water quality. So it contains the same amount or even less tritium than in your and mine drinking water. Well, so, so and, the rest and, and is all politics. It's all politics, and uh, everyone can follow uh, the release live uh, on the yes. IAEA website, where you can actually can see all the counts and all that, and and uh, it's perfectly safe. And I would I would volunteer to drink it. Uh, if not, it was rather salt. <laughs> so <laughs> because it's right. seawater. Uh, yeah. So, so it it is rather salt, but for the rest it is it is um, it is drinking water quality. Uh, so, what's your perspective on the sustainable angle of the renewable energy? Yeah, um, in my opinion, um, uh, it is not sustainable, uh, and, and it is not re reliable either. Because uh, why not sustainable? Uh, because it is uh, renewables means the way back to low energy density. So uh, it, it will renewables will never ever because of their low energy density and their low availability, they will never be able to power uh, an industrialized global community. It's just too small uh, and too uh, inefficient. And you see actually that uh, in the EU uh, and also in the US, um, the problems with renewables are already arising. Um, it is expensive. Um, the grids are already congested. There are huge investment needed to accommodate basically the peak supply of renewables because renewables are powered by the sun and by the wind, but they are not available all of the time. So the renewables transition is, a, is essentially a transition where mother nature is the boss and where a lot of energy needs to be supplied from decentralized locations, which will never used uh, or meant uh, uh, to create, uh, to produce energy. So there's a huge grid expansion needed, which costs a lot. Uh, taxpayers see that. Uh, and the grids as we are have them today uh, are already congested. So the expansion of renewables is already crashing uh, right now. Um, so my, my vision is that um, the future will be largely for nuclear uh, and it is already happening in the new world. Uh, 
well if not for uh, the uh, and, russia and also in you no if not for the russia ukraine war i think uh, europe would have gone more heavily into renewable itself right you talk about russia well yeah uh, if not for the russia ukraine war europe would have gone mo- more deep into renewable energy um yes on the short term yes um uh, uh, uh the, the the of course the the gas shortage right um actually the, the the blessing of the of the russian war if i may say so <laughs> the gas shortage that we have uh uh in the in the eu actually shows that uh solar and wind are not powered by nature but, but are actually powered by gas Correct. What do I mean with that? Take take Germany for example. This is the perfect example. Germany has uh, a solar, a combined uh, solar and wind capacity that is three times higher uh, than the energy consumption. What do I mean with that? If there was, let's take a day, uh, one day, twenty four hours. If there was a day. of 24 hours where the sun would shine uh day and night theoretically right and the wind would blow fast germany would have in theory three times more capacity than the, the germans need themselves okay can you follow me so they would need to yes, export yes. They, they would in that case they would need to export two thirds of their electricity right now there has been uh since this overcapacity which exists since i think 3 uh, 4 5 years of course this overcapacity has grown due to all the investment in renewables there has not been there has not been nanju one single day not one single day where renewables actually have provide 100% of the power now you actually now this 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 perfectly shows that the sun is not shining all the time the wind and is not blowing also restarting time. coal power plants thermal plants again exactly so they closed nuclear power plants they had a lack of gas so they had to restart the coal uh, fired power plants as a as a backup consequently consequently the result as we speak today on the 12th of september 2023 germany has over capacity of Uh, uh uh solar panels and wind turbines nevertheless because they they shut down all their backup nuclear they have a lack of gas and had to go back to coal germany is the german electricity supply is after poland the second dirtiest in the eu so germany has after poland the highest co2 emissions from their electricity production and they have to import since a year or so they are importing french nuclear electricity uh so do you so, see germany also initiating uh, but there's no communication on starting of nuclear power plants yet right no the the current uh, uh red green government is crisp and clear about it we have shut down uh, the last three operating power plants in april 2023 and we will not reopen them although experts say that today uh, if uh, if it was needed technically technically i don't know uh, i don't know the precise backgrounds but technically germany could reopen could restart in a couple of months time with good preparations eight nuclear power plants if they would want to but they will not but the but the red green government has made it crisp and clear the future uh, is uh, is for renewables and the truth is that with this renewables vision but future is renewable but coal is okay but no no nuclear how do they explain to their citizens this they can't they can't because citizens understand uh, that they are being cheated 
So you see it right now, you see right now. Uh, what does the, the EU talk about it? I mean, you used to be part of a EU administrative body in the energy space, right? Yes. Yeah. So how do these people look at Germany and what do they say about it? Um, Germany is being more and more being isolated uh, within the EU. Uh, France has made it crisp and clear uh, that France is not will not give up their position on nuclear, that they will continue to invest in nuclear. Um, there is a coalition led by France and uh, with 16 other EU member states that actually want a clean deal rather than a green deal. And what do I mean with that? Is that for 20 years, led by German ideology, also, the EU ideology has been full focus on renewables, although uh, the EU still has hundreds operating nuclear power plants, despite the closure in Germany, and nuclear is still the biggest clean energy source in the EU. The focus is clear, mandatory targets for green energy. So the EU themselves, Brussels, ensures that all money flows to green. And this is called the Green Deal. They basically say, well, uh, if countries want to build nuclear power plants, let them go ahead. But we have these mandatory targets for green, and they are increasing every, every, every year, right? And now you actually see, slowly, step by step, you see that member states, pro-nuclear member states, actually become aware that the strategy is failing, that it leads to higher energy insecurity, that it leads to higher energy cost. And that also voters, also people, uh, citizens basically become angry. So there is now, as we speak, a strong lobby to make sure that nuclear stays part of the desired energy mix. Nobody debates clean energy and nobody debates that we should get rid of fossil. But um, please, with nuclear and not without nuclear, as Germany has done, because it's a catastrophe. What do you think about the increased dependencies on electric vehicles now? Um, it's a problem. Um, certainly, if you look at um, um, if you look at uh, at the electricity mix uh, in the in the EU, basically the target, the target is to reduce uh, CO two, right? But if we see that the electricity production uh, in the EU is not becoming cleaner, uh, except the ex perfect example is Germany itself, right? Um, for there is not a lot of gain in emissions right now uh, by driving electric. Of course, electric vehicles themselves are more efficient than uh, fossil uh, vehicles. That is true. But the efficiency of the whole cycle from the production of electric vehicles and the energy required to build these batteries um, if you look at, at, at the whole chain, the advantage uh, is not that big. It's maybe 10 or 20 percent. So it's I would say it is small beer. Of course, if you drive with your electric car in Norway, which is powered by hydro, or Switzerland, which is powered by hydro and nuclear, then of course you have then the electric vehicles definitely are better than fossil vehicles. That's clear. Mm -hmm. But as long as, on average, our power production remains largely fossil-based, there is only a small advantage in uh, emissions. And then there is, of course, the issue of availability of uh, critical resources. You know, there are critical resources needed, which are only found in uh, China or in Africa, uh, the, the mining of lithium and all that, with all the associated dirty mining and child labor and... and Cobalt. 
I, I, I don't see I don't see that that is the kind of big step forwards that we need. We need clean deals. We need to acknowledge that in order to clean our energy mix, we do not only have electricity, which is just 20% of the mix, but there's also heat, the half of the mix, and there is also transport. So the, 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 the hidden agenda, I believe, behind green deals is basically to sell uh, solar panels and wind turbines as quickly as possible and increase the so-called electrification or the pace of electrification um, by also um, promoting the demand on the on, on the user side. So that's electric vehicles, but also heat pumps, right? I think what needs to be changed is we need to think about energy, first of all, on the level of energy density, but also on the level of the energy system as a whole, right? The objective is to build an energy system that is as clean and efficient and available and affordable as possible. And then I am convinced as an, as an energy expert that the traditional old system, the old central system that we had and still have, mm. if we, rather than powering that with fossil, be it for electricity or be it for heat, doesn't really matter. If we just replace all the fossil power plants with nuclear power plants, we make much bigger steps than all this nitty gritty small beer uh, with electric vehicles and wind and solar panels and all that. Well, uh, th that's pretty much your wish, right? That that's yeah. what happens. But what do you see happening? What do you see that is happening currently? Is it anywhere well, see, going towards what you want? I see. I see. Uh, I see a slow, step by step change, um, and it's not going uh, in the direction that I would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely see that basically due to uh, uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine, so the gas shortage, uh, the congestion of our grid. Um, the increasing opposition in almost all EU member states and definitely also in Germany um, shows that technically the renewables transition is already crashing technically uh, and uh, people step by step are becoming more aware uh, of the costs and disadvantages of so-called renewables. That is happening right now. So we will have uh, elections, uh, EU elections next year. There will be elections uh, in the Netherlands in November. You see in Germany that the Greens, uh, in the opinion polls, the Greens are going down uh, very, very quickly. Uh, there is, an, there is an, uh, uh, a right-wing party, which is called the Alternative für Deutschland, which is rising in the opinion polls very, very quickly. Um, so, summarizing, technically, the, the crash is already happening. And in the opinion polls, you see, uh, uh, you see a lot of dissatisfaction with the current Green Deals. Right. And what do you see that is not going to change in this whole thing? What is not going to change? Yep. <coughs> in the short term? Well, in the uh, short term, it is, it's, you already said it's going to be uh, uh, renewable energy. Will be there and will be promoted furthermore. But in the long term, what do you see will not change? Do you see people will stop focus on the renewable and double down on nuclear? Yes, that's that's what I expect. Yeah, yeah. And I also expect that um, uh, that 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 people... No, no, but that's get... a big uh, argument going pretty much 
I mean, see, the whole renewable is also associated with the global warming and climate change. Yeah. So, so do you see the whole fallout? I mean, whole splintering of this whole climate change argument in the long run, because if people have to move from here to there, if renewable have to collapse, this whole climate change argument has to wither away to some extent. Yes, and I think that will happen. Yeah, yeah, and I think that 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 um, we will see more focus on adaptation uh, rather than mitigation. So it will become it will become more and more clear. I, th I think the realization that we have much more time uh, to adapt uh, and to change our to clean our energy infrastructure uh, or to clean our energy production. That realization uh, uh, it will uh, will happen uh, in the next ten years, uh, and that will uh, that will trigger uh, basically a shop uh, a swap towards nuclear, where I think the realization will be that we have more time than we think, than most people well, think. Wonderful. So, Andre, uh, just before we close, if you want to give a shout out to our uh, audience who are into mostly entrepreneurial community and senior business leaders. What kind of a shouter would you want to give? The shout out is um, we want uh, clean deals and not green deals. So the focus should be is uh, to get rid uh, of our fossil energy addiction uh, and include all uh, all options in that right that's my first shout out and give as far as i'm concerned nuclear should be priority number one it's one thing two um, look at the energy system uh, as a whole uh, and three uh, listen to the science please wonderful andre thank you so much and uh... So you heard it, clean deal versus green deal argument. So you make the decision, share it across. At least whether you agree or not, share and participate in a debate because it's a very important debate pertaining to each of our future. And uh, follow future fast. And you can also follow Andre. He shares some fantastic data and statistics keep coming, making solid case for nuclear. You agree or not, do follow because it's the right information and it's always good to be well informed. And uh, till we bring him back again to make his prediction, enjoy the ride. And if you are not subscribed to CCFAS, do it now. Andre, thank you so much once again for being part of CCFAS. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nanju, for uh, for having me, and uh, you encourage me to continue my journey. So, thanks again.